Hi there. I'm Kevin O'Connor, and welcome back to Ask This Old House. Hey, Roger. Good morning, Kevin. So you working on a gutter story? Well, it involves gutters. When it rains, all the water comes off the roof, into the gutter, down the downspout, and goes out into the backyard and eventually into the street. What a waste of water. Sounds like the perfect spot for a rain barrel. Too small. Think bigger. All right, I'm hooked. So a little later on, Roger's going to show us a big rainwater harvesting story. Good morning, Tommy. Hey, Kevin. What are you working on today? Well, I got a letter from a homeowner that has a home office and a living room divided by a wall. They'd like to put a big opening in that wall to join the two rooms together. So it sounds like uh, a wall's got to come down. Anytime you're going to take down a wall, there's a few things you should check. Are there any pipes in there? Any wires in there? And is it actually holding anything else up, like the building? Right. That would be a load-bearing wall. Come on into our living room, Tom. We've uh, taped off this opening that we want to get rid of this wall to create more flow in the living room. Mm -hmm. Ideally, Tommy, we'd like the, uh, the opening to be about the same span as this existing opening here. Okay, so you want a mirror image of this opening on this wall. That's exactly right. right. All right, now I know that we're on the second floor, and I know that there's an attic above, but I don't know if there's a load-bearing wall. And what's a load-bearing wall, Tom? Well, does this wall carry the floor of the attic, all right? If it is, we're going to have to restructure this wall. So if I remove the structure, I have to replace the structure. Next thing is I want to see if there's anything in our way on the other side of the wall. Let's go on the other side. Okay, great. All right, we're also taped off on this side of the wall, and let's see what we've got going on here. Well, we've got a radiator down here, and this doesn't have to be moved because it's going to be right past this opening, so that's not going to be a problem. But you do have a doorway right here that we have to deal with, all right? So let's take a walk up in the attic and see which wall is load-bearing. Okay. All right, let me show you your joist system up here in the attic. On one end of the joist, they rest on the outside wall right there. Mm -hmm. On the other end of the joist, they rest on that outside wall right over here. Now, I've opened up a section of your floorboards in your attic to see where the floor joists meet. And they meet right here on this load-bearing wall. Now, this is the wall that you want to cut the opening in. So, can we cut that opening? Absolutely. We're going to have to do some restructuring, though. What about the other wall, uh, Tommy, the one that uh, has the doorway in it? That runs perpendicular to this load-bearing wall, runs this way, which is parallel to the joist. You can see the top plate right here? There's nothing on that. That wall can come down without any problems at all. Oh, great. All right, let's get started. Okay. All right, now remember, the 2 by 8s in the attic floor ran from the outside walls to this interior load-bearing wall. And what we want to do is cut a hole in this load-bearing wall and remove the structure. But before we do that, we have to build a temporary wall to hold up the joist. All right, now what I've done is I've taken two 2 by 8s I have one for the floor and one for the ceiling. I've cut four 2 by 4s about two inches longer than the distance between the two 2 by 8s okay? Well, we've got the 2 by 4s here, Tom. All right, put your toe on that one and pull okay. the 2 by 4 to you. Okay, Brett, put yours under there. Put your toe against it and pull the middle. And just a little bit. I want to put some tension on it, but I don't want to crack the ceiling. Amy, I want you to tighten up yours a little more. Really bow it. There you go. All right, let's get two more two-by-fours, and we want to create an A. Okay, now put the bottom on the two-by-eight. There you go. All right, now stand on the other side over there. Reach around and grab this one and pull on it. A little more. Good, sir. Pull it hard. Okay, there you go. All right, now we've created one A right here. See that? I see it, yeah. All right, Brett, now we want to do one on this side. The top right up against this 2 by 4 here. Okay, now stand on the other side of this 2 by 4 over here, reach around, and bend it and pull it at the same time. That's good. Pull it harder. Put some tension on it. One more, one more. Good. All right, let me put a couple of screws in it temporarily. Now we have to build another brace on the other side of the wall. To minimize the plaster dust from getting in the rest of your house, I like to use these spring-loaded poles right here with some plastic. Now, they actually have these cups on the top, or plates, and we're going to put the plastic there, snap this on it, put it on there like that. Now, we just unscrew the pole, bring it up tight, pull the plastic tight from the other pole that we've already put on there, bring it tight like that. Now, we want to adjust the bottom, and push it down like that. Tighten them up. Now, before we cut a hole into this wall, we want to check to see if there were any pipes or any electrical outlets. There was one electrical outlet, and we killed the power to that, and no pipes. So now we're ready to cut. Now, the next thing I want to do is start ripping the plaster off of the lab. We're going to go gently because I don't want to make a lot of dust. Now we go after the lab.
All right, with all of the plaster and lath removed off of both sides of the wall, we've exposed our two by four structure. Now we have to remove the structure. Now, when we remove the structure, we have to install a header right up here, and the header is the height right here that's on this line. The header is gonna carry the load that the structure is now carrying. So what I wanna do is I want to cut along this line right above each stud, creating a pocket for the beam to go in. By doing that, I'm leaving a piece of stud above the line to the underside of the plate. When I insert the header, the header will hit the two by fours and support them. The two by fours will go up and support the plate. The plate will support the joist from up above. Here's where I cut the top of the stud. Behind the plaster, the lath is nailed to the stud on each side of the wall. So I cut those nails, freeing up the stud. Now I'm gonna move the stud back and forth and free it up from the bottom. Hopefully I can get it out in one piece. There's one. Right, that's the last of the studs. It's really starting to open up. Oh, it looks great in here. I can already feel the flow in the room. There's a big difference. Yeah. Now, the only thing that's holding up your attic floor are these temporary braces, but not for long. Now we have to make up a beam to insert into this groove that we've made. And we're going to make that out of two by eight, two of them, and one filler. Great. Our rough opening width is six feet. To span that opening, we're going to make a beam up using two two by eights. Our wall thickness is three and three quarters. Now the two two by eights nailed together equal three inches. To make up the difference, I've ripped down some three quarter inch fillers and I will nail and glue those between the two two by eights, making up a beam. All right, now that our beam is made up and before we insert it into the slot, let me show you what we've got. Inside the wall right here, this is an existing stud and it runs all the way from the underside of the plate in the attic all the way down to the top of the plate on the wall on the first floor. That's called a king stud. Now to carry this end of the beam, we're gonna use a stud right here that'll be shorter. This is a jack stud. I'm gonna take this jack stud and I'm gonna place it tight against the king stud. Now what I've done is I've applied these fillers to the jack stud that's going to go against the king stud. Now this jack stud will be in too far, so I'm going to have to put a second jack stud against these fillers after we install the beam, and this one will define the rough opening. Now the first thing I want to do is I want to install the jack stud with the fillers on it against the king stud. I'm going to use some construction adhesive to hold the lath and the plaster to the jack stud. I'm going to also put some adhesive on the back side of the plaster and lath where the beam's going to go. All right, now we're ready to put the beam in place, but let me show you what I've done first on one end. On one end, I've cut this end on an angle. On the other end, I've cut it square. The reason I've cut it on an angle is because I need to put the beam up on top of our first jack, and it has to go into the opening on an angle. Now let me show you how the angle works for me. It allows me to push the beam up. Okay, push it up. I can push it right up as high as I can get it. All right, now we're ready for this jack stud. There you go. All right, now I gotta hit this up. And this should push that beam up. Straighten it out, and we're just about in. All right, now I'm just going to nail the jack to the king. All right, now we're ready for the last jack. Now, the last jack is actually just a filler jack 
and that's to define the rough opening. So I'm going to put it in here, slip it into the wall. Okay, Brett, you can unscrew those temporary braces and we can take them down. You got that, Brett? I got it. Okay. Tom, this looks great. The size of the opening here matches the size here. It looks so great. And then with the trim all finished and the floor finished, it's going to look fabulous. Thank you so much. It's going to make a big difference. Thanks a lot, Tom. It looks fantastic. Tommy, it was great that you were able to go up into the attic, pull the floorboards back, look at that anatomy of that wall, and confirm that it was load bearing. Right, it's always good when you can see the bones of the building. But you can't always gain access from the top. And even if you are 99% sure that that wall can come out, it's still nerve-wracking to cut <laughs> a wall. Well, even if you're a little bit unsure, you should always bring in a professional to tell you if it's a load-bearing wall, what size header you need for that wall, and how to temporarily brace it so you can cut that open. It's really short money. I think I'll call you. Okay. <laughs> Tom, the lesson I liked was the way you cut the studs off creating a pocket for the beam without ripping the plaster off all the way to the ceiling. Well, I like to do it that way because it saves me a lot of work, less plastering to do. What a difference having that room opened up. Big difference. All right, guys, here we go. It's rubbery. Oh, yeah. It's got a slot and an oval hole in it, and it's cream in color. What is it? Yeah, I'll tell you what it isn't. It's not cream. That's toast. No, actually, it's beige. It looks like a moth to me, actually, Tom. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> this is a new invention. You know, it has been a long time since they've invented a new noodle. Yeah, he's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it's been like 500 years. Yeah. But, you know, back in the heyday, Europa was filled with noodle universities. And they were pumping out noodles all the time. It was the golden era. They had macaroni. Rigatoni. Cannelloni. Exactly. But now, 500 years later, the first one, the flapperoni. <laughs> Flap oh, yeah, look at that. Perfect for Americans, too. It's oversized, white flour, loaded with sugar, and it's got a little handhold right here, so you can slide it right down. Oh, nice. oh, oh boy. Oh, oh, Not from the pasta industry, from my friend, who's a pianist. Pianist? Yeah, piano player. Okay. All day long, he plays that beautiful music. Sure. At the end of the day, his fingers get tired. Oh. No one has ever made an exercise for fingers until now. Fingers of steel. <laughs> Just use the rubber band, and at the end of the day, he can play the beautiful melody. <laughs> Well, <laughs> has this ever happened to you? You're screwing. You know, you're just screwing around, you're driving screws in, and you just lose your screwdriver. It falls out of your hand. Oh, yeah. 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 That happens a lot. It's awful. <laughs> Look at this, baby. Put that right on there. Oh, you can't shake yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great idea. Put yeah. the sharp instrument, strap it to your hand. Is that you know, how you I did. I, I, you I, guys, I you, so you guys don't have a clue what you're talking about. Have yeah. you ever installed a nice piece of trim work, and, you know, you may have got a nail in, and you want to... All of a sudden, you got to get that nail out because it bent. Sure. Well, you bent it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but you take a hammer and you got to damage the wood. Well, this oh. is a cover for the hammer. You put it on. Oh. Are you going to strap that hammer to your hand? No. It goes right over the head like this. Pretty easy, huh? Yeah, it's meant to stay on there once it's on there. Now, when I try to pull that nail out, the rubber protects the hammer from damaging the wood. Like nail aroni. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I try to be as environmentally conscious as possible, which is why we installed this rain barrel. We wanted to reduce the amount of water that we were using from the city, and it's worked okay, but there's been a couple problems with it. One, there's really no water pressure off of it, and it also doesn't hold a lot of water. The barrel ends up running dry relatively quickly. Roger, this 50-gallon rain barrel just isn't enough. There's got to be a better solution. Alan, this is what we're going to be installing today. This is a rain pillow. It's going to hold water for you that you can use for irrigating your property. How much water does this store? It's going to hold 650 gallons. Now, the nice thing about this pillow is it was custom designed to fit in underneath your deck. Well, that's good because we don't ever use this. It's pretty much just wasted space. Right, and having that pillow up in this area right here makes it easy to connect to this downspout, and that's going to fill the pillow. Now, it holds 650 gallons. That's the equivalent to having 13 of these rain barrels. Wow. So that's a lot of water. Yeah, that's a lot of water. All right, what I want you to do is get all the sticks, the stone, the mulch, everything off of this concrete surface so we can lay the bladder in here. I want it nice and clean. You got it. Now I'm just going to chisel away this mound of concrete so it doesn't pierce the bottom of the pillow. To protect the bottom of the pillow, we're just going to lay down this top. How are you looking down there? Good? Yeah, it looks great. Now, with the top in place, we're just going to lay the pillow right on top. Just keep it up, keep it up so we don't drag the top. That looks good. Here's how we're going to get the water into the water pillow. 
We're going to take the water from the downspout, and we're going to bring it over into this box. Now, this box acts as a filter also. It has a filter pad inside it to keep any debris from getting into our water pillar. This will get screwed right in place here. The water will come out this bottom fitting and into the water pillar. Roger, what's that pipe in your hand? Oh, this pipe is for the overflow. Now, if you just hold that corner of the box for me, I'm just going to screw it in place. Nice. Take those fittings off the bottom of the downspout, and then we'll put in some elbows to bring the water into the box. This is the offset that's going to get the water right into the box. All right, slide that piece of two-inch PVC pipe right into the bottom of the filter box. Now, my flexible pipe is going to connect right to that. Now, we're just dry fitting it for now. You can see where the water is going to come all the way down the flexible pipe and into our water pillow. Roger, how come the pipe's flexible? Because when this water pillow fills with water, it's going to raise up. When it empties out, it's going to go down. So we need that flex in here. Why don't you take and glue that PVC pipe in, and I'm going to hang the flexible pipe. <laughs> for a five count. One, two, three, four, five. Boy, you can count. I'm awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Now I'm going to glue up the connection from the flexible pipe to the top of the pillow. Now we've got all our connections made to get the water into the water pillow. Now we've got to think about getting it out. Over here we have a connection on the side of the pillow, and it comes out to a ball valve so we can shut it on and off. Then it goes into this flexible pipe, which brings it up into our half horsepower pump. And this pump's what's going to allow us to have water pressure. That's right. Now you look at this. This is a pretty heavy-duty pump. Yep. So that's really going to push some water for us, and it's just going to plug in, and we'll be good to go. Now what I want you to do is connect this hose to the top of the pump. When the pump's activated, the water's going to come through that hose all the way over here to your anti-siphoning valve, which keeps the water from siphoning out of the water pillow. Past that, it goes to a garden hose, and that's going to connect to your sprinkler. Great. To test the system, I filled the rain pillow using your garden hose. This is what it's going to look like when it's filled with rainwater. Yeah, and it's pretty full. 650 gallons full. Now, if you look here on the filter box, I installed an overflow pipe that runs down in daylight right there. We can just cover it up with moats. So I don't have to look at it anymore. Right. And that black pipe over there is another overflow for the pillow itself. So now that we have this installed, how do I actually turn this thing on? Well, the good news is you don't have to crawl way underneath there to turn the pump on. All you got to do is use this little remote. That's great. Just hit it and turn that pump on, and there it goes. Roger, this is great. I can't wait to start saving some water. And it's a lot better than a rain barrel. A lot better than 13 of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually pretty ingenious. Yeah. So what does it mean like that cost? Well, that was a custom fit unit. That was 650 gallons. It was $2,000. Wow. Their standard unit, which is 1,000 gallons, cost $2,500. So wow. not, cheap. No, not cheap. No, it's not inexpensive. And in communities where the water costs are low, it may not be the right solution. Well, where I live, water is expensive. We also have a sewer surcharge, and that's based on the amount of water that we bring into the house. That's right. You know, there's no way to meter sewage going out, so some communities just charge a double. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> what they do. You know, in my town, every summer it seems like they ban the use of water. Yeah. This would be a great solution if we had a green line. It's not just your town. It's communities across the country that have bans, literally no watering at all. And this would help them have a green lawn and plants. Yeah. All right, good information, and good to know it's out there. Thank you, Roger. You're welcome. Well, if you've got a question about your house, send us a letter or send us an email because we'd love to hear from you. And until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Richard Thuy. I'm Roger Cook. And I'm Tom Silva. For Ask This Old House. So now we got a water bed, now we got a water pillow. Yeah. Do you have like a water blanket? <laughs> oh. If you have a question about your house or a tip you'd like to share, please let us know. Visit our website, pbs.org, for expert advice, step by step videos, and much more. Next time on Ask This Old House, Richard treks to Tampa to tackle the heat and the humidity. Look at this. How you guys live here? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, this is nothing. You ought to come see us in the summer. <laughs> no, thank you. That's next time.